You're listening to the Partially Examined Life, a philosophy podcast by some guys who were at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. A question for episode 93 is something like, do we really have free will? We'll be discussing Peter Strassen's Freedom and Resentment from 1960, his son Galen Strassen's The Impossibility of Moral Responsibility from 1994, Gary Watson's Responsibility and the Limits of Evil, Variations on a Strassonian Theme from 1987, and we may also refer to Thomas Nagel's Moral Luck from 1979. You can join the discussion, get the texts, and lots more information at partiallyexaminedlife.com. This is Mark Linsenmeyer in Madison, Wisconsin. This is Seth Paskin in Austin, Texas. This is Wes Owen in Boston, Massachusetts. This is Tamler Summers in Houston, Texas. Welcome, Tamler, from the Very Bad Wizards podcast. Yeah, welcome. You may have heard him on the precognition for this episode. Thanks for doing that, Tamler. The talking into a microphone by myself just was very uncomfortable, but I'm glad you guys got something out of it. Yes, that was very helpful. And I thought we'd start with the Galen Strassen article, just like you did on the precog. Yeah, I mean, I thought this set up the problem really nicely, even though it's the most recent of all the articles. I do think it sets up the problem of moral responsibility and free will. And the other two are ways of resisting the conclusion, I guess. Right. So the main articles are by P.F. Strassen, the father, and Galen Strassen, the son. Both these articles were ones that are discussed on the first two episodes of your podcast, The Very Bad Wizards. And one of the things you pointed out there was that determinism is something that regularly comes back into fashion. It's not something that's been discovered recently, certainly not by neuroscientists, but it is something that was there right, what, from the ancients? Yeah, of course. It's, yeah. it's in the ancients. L- Lucretius, Epicurus. Yeah. Right. As soon as you start doing any kind of metaphysics, you get the idea of causality. If there is one event, it must have been caused by some prior event. So it seems to fall from that, that the event of my thinking, the event of my making a choice, the event of my doing something, that too must have had a cause. And we may not be able to say what that cause was. We know that there are causes. Or as uh, one of the authors points out, at least you can't prove that there aren't any. It's not a falsifiable claim either way. Well, except that determinism isn't really the issue. I mean, and this is certainly Galen Strassen's view, right, that it just doesn't matter. I mean, so either way is unfalsifiable. But if it's not determined, if it's indetermined, then it's just random. And that doesn't do any good in terms of granting you responsibility for your actions or for your character. So the big problem with libertarianism is that they've never been able to figure out exactly how this indeterminism is supposed to grant you any more responsibility then could be granted if determinism were true. So now why is that the only other option? Just, I think that folks listening to this will, of course, the native libertarian, the thing we believed before people started complaining about determinism, before people either invented or reminded us of this is, of course, I as an individual am responsible for my actions. Maybe you think that the pre-philosophical view is some sort of Cartesian or religious. I have a soul that is disconnected from the causal chain. And so it is what is doing things. It's me. And it doesn't seem like just as a matter of logic, it's either everything is determined or it's random. Why? Well, I mean, what did you think? So Galen Strawson, he has an argument even against that, right? Towards the end where he talks about the CPM and this self. So the CPM is the character, personality, motivations. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you have the self that's independent of that. But then you can just run that same argument on the self. Well, why did the self, given its CPM, given its character, its motivations, its personality, why did the self choose one course of action rather than the other? And if it's going to be responsible for that choice, well, then it has to be responsible for being the kind of self that would make that choice. And you just run that same argument on that. So... That's where, I guess, at least according to Galen Strawson, it really is a matter of logic. It just doesn't matter. You can take whatever metaphysical fantasy you want, and you still can't get that kind of ultimate responsibility that he thinks is crucial for moral responsibility. Yeah, I think there's a weakness there. So, for instance, he says, however self-consciously aware we are as we deliberate and reason, every act and operation of our mind happens as it does as a result of features for which we are ultimately in no way responsible. But I think there are many accounts of free will, which are arguably compatibilist, where all that matters is that you be sensitive to what's good for you and sensitive to reasons for acting in a certain way or not acting in a certain way. And sure, that sensitivity can be underwritten by brain processes that are all deterministic. I still don't think it would help with 
the notion of moral responsibility in a sense of being praiseworthy or blameworthy. I think Galen's argument is actually very strong on that. Once you start getting into things, it's hard to ground the concept of blameworthiness. But then it sounds like you completely agree with him. Where do you think you disagree? I think there's room for a conception of free will, which doesn't ground radical moral responsibility in the sense of being blameworthy or praiseworthy. I know that's an odd view, but you know, I'm sympathetic to Nietzsche's sort of skepticism about this brand of moral responsibility where you say at some metaphysical level, someone is blameworthy, which is not to say that you can't say someone is of poor character, that they're an asshole. You can still make those sorts of judgments yeah. or that even that they're immoral. It's just that trying to ground that in some sense of factual blameworthiness, I think, is kind of a fool's errand. On the other hand, that doesn't mean there isn't room for the kind of compatibilism where reason responsiveness represents a kind of free will, even if that doesn't ground this radical sense of blameworthiness that I'm talking about. Why is it radical? A sense like blameworthiness seems pretty non-radical to just be blameworthy, to deserve blame, to deserve punishment for your actions. So if you want to call a compatibilist freedom free will, I have no issue with that. When you disconnect free will from blameworthiness or praiseworthiness or dessert, to me, it becomes a terminological question at that point. No, I don't, I don't think so, because there are still moral implications, right? There are people who could be in greater or lesser states of compulsion. They can still have virtues and vices, you know. So as we'll see, P.F. Strassen will talk about the potential for certain kinds of therapeutic approaches to make people more or less free. All of those things still apply. And all of them are of moral import, right? It doesn't matter if someone's to blame. It's really about people existing along a spectrum of being more or less free. And that matters. I agree. Yeah. It's just that I don't think it matters whether you call it free will or not. What matters is the kind of freedom that we have. Hey, before we launch into this, Seth, do you have some opening thoughts on this article? I'll just preface this by saying, in the interest of transparency... This is not a particularly live issue for me. I guess I'm a naive compatibilist. My everyday experience of my own life is that I have choice and I have to act as if. So in a lot of ways, this is an academic exercise from my perspective. And so I'm hoping to get persuaded that there's something more nuanced about it than that for me. Well, I, I hope I'll be able to persuade you of that. <laughs> it seems like just from what Wes was laying out, I think it's a kind of a typical ambivalence about this, that the concern is not really between metaphysical account of free will of the type that I was saying, you know, something like Cartesian dualism. And personally, I feel like we've sufficiently ruled that out just because those views have serious metaphysical problems. But it would take too long, and none of the articles that we read really take much time in going through and explaining why anything like Cartesianism, anything like your view that you have an immortal soul that has this absolute free choice granted to you by God. I think we should say a little more about why Galen Strassen thinks that doesn't make any sense, but that's not what philosophers today are generally arguing about. Maybe some of them are, but like so many theological things, it, it's often covert. Well, no, they are. So someone like Cain, for instance, uh, that we went to you know, the University of Texas with, is arguing for a libertarian point of view. Well, he's arguing for libertarianism, but he still feels like he can't use theological terminology. He has to yeah. say something like, yeah. at the quantum level, there's indeterminism, that that actually allows for freedom. Right. But it's still sort of a radical freedom where the agent can intervene in some sense in the causal chain without being directly caused, let's say. For libertarianism, there's two categories, one of which is called agent causal libertarian. And those are of the Cartesian kind of you have mm -hmm. a soul and the soul causes that's a mover unmoved. And then there's event causal libertarianism where there is indeterminacy in our brain processes at certain key junctures. And that's what grants us free will. And Cain is of that event causal oh, okay. variety. So he's trying to keep his version of agency naturalistic. So in that sense, I think Mark's right that he doesn't want to resort to that kind of terminology. But I think, Wes, you're right that it is still a live option among a minority of contemporary philosophers. 
Right. Certainly you can find literature on this kind of thing. I was looking at YouTube videos about this, one of which was by somebody at a Christian university. You're going to get a lot of diversity in views that reach back into many historical periods. And some folks, oh yeah, Augustine was the guy that got it right in the first place. But in terms of the part of the tradition that we're focusing on here, the part that at least has been most interesting to people like Tamler who are working in this area is it comes down to given that determinism at least is not falsifiable, at least could be correct. And as you say, indeterminism, randomness wouldn't help the matter. Can we give a coherent account of compatibilism, right? The idea that we have this obvious experience, as Seth referred to, of our own free choice. And we think that after we do something that we could have done something else, how do we actually explain that, that that makes sense, given what Galen Strassen is reminding us, this a priori argument that more responsibility, the kind of freedom that would allow for more responsibility. And the illustration that he gives for that is whether or not you believe in heaven and hell, the way to figure out whether you think somebody's really responsible for a crime is would that person, if the crime is nasty enough, actually deserve to go to hell and burn forever? And if you don't think that, then you don't actually believe in more responsibility. I actually think that was a big mistake on his part to say, <laughs> to, 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 to use that heaven and hell analogy, because You could certainly be a compatibilist or a libertarian and think that just because you rob a liquor store, you don't deserve to burn in hell for all of eternity. I think the heaven and hell story is less helpful maybe than just non-consequentialist blame and punishment, the kind of freedom that would ground being punished or being blamed even if there were no beneficial consequences. So just deserving blame. And and I honestly think, Wes, I don't think you can call yourself a real compatibilist unless you think that blameworthiness is compatible with determinism or naturalism. P.F. Strawson seems to be arguing for a kind of compatibilism in which blameworthiness isn't justifiable descriptively, right? There's no proposition or, or metaphysics to it. That's all I'm saying. But he just doesn't think that's what blameworthiness is. He certainly thinks that people can be blameworthy. Well, they can be blameworthy in a sense of being blamed by people. I don't think there's anything beyond that. I think Watson characterizes Strawson very well, because Strawson doesn't say this explicitly, but Watson points out there's no descriptive content to Strassen's moral view. In other words, you can't put forward any descriptive or metaphysical proposition that is sort of a barrier between reactive attitudes and the nature of morality. Moral responsibility just is constituted by reactive attitudes. And once you've said that, I think you're no longer really asserting what I've called this radical blameworthiness. It's, it, these are practices which human beings can't give up. And then the other point is that these are practices which determinism can't really bear on. I didn't mean to suggest that blameworthiness has to have some sort of metaphysical proposition attached to it or be a metaphysical property. Well, it can't even be a statement of affairs in the world except to say that people blame each other. But also there's the moral like it's okay that people blame each other, that they're not being irrational, that it's appropriate. If you're going to be a compatibilist, you have to at least believe that, that it's appropriate. No, I don't think so. And I think Watson at the end of his paper gets at this. First of all, we can have reactive attitudes that conflict with each other, and ultimately, we can reject retributive attitudes and the idea of moral desert and be compatibilists. I think that's possible. Fair enough. You're probably not alone. So let's look at that quote that was right near the end about how you can't question the practice itself. Where is that? Bottom of 13. Right. Okay. Inside the general structure or web of human attitudes and feelings of which I've been speaking, there's endless room for modification, redirection, criticism, and justification. In other words, contrary to what Wes just said, it's not just that people blame each other, but that there's sort of a logic to the practice of blaming such that, you know, somebody could be wrong to blame in a particular circumstance and somebody else could argue with them. And there actually might really be a correct answer as to whether blame is correct in this case. There's more to it than just brute actions of people. Continuing, but questions of justification are internal to the structure or relate to modifications internal to it. The existence of the general framework of attitudes itself, in other words, the fact that we do blame people, is something that we are given with the fact of human society. As a whole, it neither calls for nor permits an external rational justification. Right? So he says all the historical arguments over free will versus determinism are really whether moral responsibility is legitimate or not, whether you're talking about freedom in that context or not. Comparison he makes somewhere is it's like 
Hume complaining about causality, about induction being justified. This is one of the tools which we come to the world with in the first place. We have no power to overturn it. It's misguided to ask the question is something like resentment or blaming practices. Is it something as a whole that's inappropriate or irrational? But you can ask the question, should I have blamed my wife for yelling at me Mm -hmm. for not doing the dishes that day? Even though I just ruptured my Achilles tendon and I was lying on the floor, writhing in pain. Like, that's a question that you can ask because that's internal to the structure of blaming can be rational and appropriate on some occasions. We're just asking if it was appropriate on that occasion, right? But what you can't ask, according to Strawson, is, is it ever justified? Yeah, and you can't ask that according to him because we just couldn't do that in our daily lives. We couldn't give up our reactive attitudes if we tried. And even if we could, whether or not we should give them up would be determined by some sort of pragmatic question of whether or not it was useful to do so, let's say, or its implications. The gains and losses to human life. So you can't criticize, but you you also can't praise it, right? You can't say it's okay that we judge each other. Any sort of estimation, positive or negative, is really inapplicable to the practice as a whole. Yeah, I think these are weak arguments, right? They're not, though. But I understand (laughs) that you might think that at first. (laughs) Well, there are lots of things that we can theorize about that we can't live out in our daily practice. If we were to become a Peronian skeptic, for instance, I might want you to think that you know nothing. But he's not saying that you could live as if you knew nothing. The theoretical and the habitual are two different realms. I don't even think this is really the core of his argument, because the most important part, and I think the strongest part of his argument, is that when we modify our reactive attitudes towards others, the theory of determinism couldn't possibly be a factor in that. So, you know, typically someone who thinks there's a problem between free will and determinism will say, look, determinism looks like compulsion, and we know that people who are compelled to do things aren't free. And Strassen is saying, actually, no, You know, when we say because someone is mentally ill or they're a child, it's not because of compulsion or determinism that we excuse them for some behavior that we might might normally resent someone for or say someone is blameworthy for. It's because we are reacting to their state of mind and their state of mind or their will doesn't contain certain essential things which would produce the reactive attitude in us. So if someone accidentally does something to me, they never had ill will in the first place. Or if someone is mentally ill to a certain extent, they're not enough a part of the moral community that we could make some reasonable moral demand on them. And that doesn't require determinism at all. And I think that is actually a very strong argument. It's the one that Watson will spend his time responding to. And also the potential vulnerability of the argument, because one of those particular specific things is the unfortunate formative circumstances when you look at the person's childhood. And so, right. So then Watson's point is if the reason that we're excusing them is because they have some sort of unfortunate formative circumstances, well, why are we excusing them for that? Could it be because we think that they are determined to... Right, exactly. What if you think they're not determined to it, but they just lack a certain amount of information or experience or knowledge of other alternatives or awareness that the way in which they're making decisions isn't taking into account other sorts of things? I mean, I think this is right. That Galen Strawson's idea is that that could be the case as well. And that would be another example of where it's not their fault that they didn't choose the right path or didn't choose the right course of action or the right kind of life. It wasn't accessible to them, not because it was necessarily determined. It's just that that particular option of doing the right thing wasn't. Is that what you mean? I guess I'm saying, does everything flow back into the determinist framework where you say like, well, if they're unaware that such and such a behavior is blameworthy, and by completely unaware, I mean, it can be because of malformed development, it could be because of unawareness of cultural norms, it could be lack of moral development, like you don't have the same level of moral accountability for a seven-year-old as you do a 35-year-old. But that's not because the seven-year-old is more determined than the 35-year-old. Right. Right. That's actually a nice statement of a nice example of Strassen's point. The reason we don't hold the seven-year-old responsible has nothing to do with determinism. It's that they're seven. 
<laughs> yeah, Seth, I think you're making P.F. Strassen's point, which I think in most cases applies, right? Where it's not determinism that's an issue, it's what's in their will and the, it's their mental state, let's say, that's at issue. So. Yeah, well, I, I wake up every morning and I do find myself <laughs> more convinced by P.F. Strassen's Every day. Oh, uh, what a coincidence. <laughs> See, I was paying attention. You keep a little P.F. Strassen on the uh, <laughs> on the bedside table. That's right. It's nice to fall asleep to his extremely <laughs> elaborate, confusing style. But yeah, his writing style was challenging for sure. I have to put the photo face down when my wife comes into bed. <laughs> <laughs> How much of your audience will have read these? Should we go through the essays or should we just talk about it like we're talking well, about? At whatever points in particular we want to talk about it. This is not about summarizing. This is about getting at the issues, which I don't care if we then are bringing things up from the Watson as they seem relevant, bringing up from any of them. You already were organized in your precog, so we don't necessarily have to be. Okay, good. What did you guys think of the induction analogy? So footnote seven in Freedom and Resentment, he says, compare the justification of induction. And he says, the human commitment to inductive belief formation is original, natural, non-rational. It's not irrational. And in no way something we choose or could give up. But rational criticism and reflection can refine standards in their application, supply rules for judging cause and effect. Ever since the fact were made clear by Hume, people have been resisting acceptance of them. So I thought that's interesting. And although I was initially resistant to that analogy, well, those are two different things. I'm now struggling to see what the difference is. So as philosophers, we can pretend I am rejecting the plausibility or the rationality of inductive belief formation. But really, the only thing we can do is criticize or revise our attitudes or beliefs within the general framework of induction is a rational form of forming beliefs. This is related again to, you know, what I thought were the weaknesses of his argument, right? This idea that if we can't live as if we're something we're true habitually and mold our behavior on that, then we can't possibly believe it's true. So you think you can believe that induction is not a rational way of forming beliefs? Sure. But that doesn't mean you're not going to do it. That doesn't mean that you're not going to live that way. In the same way that knowing that simultaneity is an absolute because of relativity doesn't mean that I can even conceive of what that means fully or live as if simultaneity weren't absolute. There are lots of crazy things in physics, curvature of space or, or whatever, which are not going to intuitively apply at my level. And I can't possibly live as if they were true. But it doesn't mean that I can't form abstractions or high level beliefs as to their truth based on evidence based on just modeling right so say general relativity right i think josh green says this in one of his papers that look i have to see the world in euclidean space terms but apparently space time is curved when i go to the grocery store i can't think of it like that but when we're launching rocket ships we have to take the formulas of general relativity into account and that's what he thinks we should do when it comes to moral responsibility and criminal justice. So when we're living in everyday life, we can blame our friends and our families and our children and our wives and husbands, etc. But when the stakes are high, like in criminal justice, we have to go with the truth. We have to go with what we really believe is true. Hmm. I Actually, that's an interesting analogy. That is. Yeah, that's an interesting. It's a good it's, it's a very good analogy. I do think there's a way it's disanalogous to the moral responsibility question, because the reason that we know that general relativity or that we can believe reliably that general relativity is a better way of understanding reality, that's based on the fact that we've done experiments and that it has more predictive power. It has more explain. No. So we're talking actually about special relativity. And Einstein published a paper long before there's any experimental confirmation. There is simply a paradox between the constancy of the speed of light and Galilean relativity. And the power of his explanation was that it resolved that paradox. It wasn't because of experimental evidence that it was developed. It was developed as a model to solve a certain problem that had arisen within science. Of course, ultimately, if experiments had refuted it, it would have been a problem. But no one had to live that, and it didn't have to be intuitively applicable for it to be true or for someone to believe it was true. That's fine. Think of it that way. 
right? But it's different when it comes to moral responsibility because the reason that you might believe that moral responsibility and blameworthiness are something that you should reject or something that's impossible, as Galen Strassen thinks, is because you find certain premises of an argument intuitive. There's no way in which the world makes more sense if you reject blameworthiness or moral responsibility. There's no predictions that you make that can be verified or falsified based on rejecting moral responsibility rather than embracing a compatibilist understanding of blameworthiness and freedom. It's purely just we find it intuitive that it's not fair to blame people if they're not the source or ultimate cause of their characters in some way. And so... That's the disanalogy right there, is that we're talking about an intuition, and you can reject that intuition without messing up any other part of the world. Yeah, but I just don't think that's true. I think the whole point of Watson's paper is to show that, in fact, determinism is relevant to how we habitually blame people. But once you get into it, blameworthiness just falls apart. It becomes incoherent. Once after you've established that determinism is in fact relevant, the more you look at it, the more the notion simply falls apart. And then, and we can go into more detail into that as we discuss Watson. it Watson's. only falls apart because of an intuition that you have. Yeah, the intuition is that people who are compelled, people who are under compulsion, are not responsible for their actions, right? You find that intuitive. And if determinism, you can reject it. And I understand that we could disagree about the intuitiveness of determinism seeming like compulsion. Mm -mm. Just the idea that compulsion exonerates somebody from a responsibility, you can reject that into it. Okay, you could reject right. that as well. But I think that would not be consistent with a lot of people's <laughs> intuitions. Yeah, and then we'd have to part ways. I think just based on, in, at that point, we'd have no way of settling that dispute. So Watson opens up the idea that we could abandon retributive sentiments. And that, so for instance, in Einstein or a Gandhi or Martin Luther King, people who adhere to some other ideal. So for instance, you could hold people responsible in the sense of confronting an oppressor without actually engaging in vindictiveness and malice. And the argument for that would be sort of a platonic conception of justice where certain attitudes are actually poisonous, or you could say Aristotelian conceptions of virtues. And I think this is where you get into virtue ethics. So Nietzsche finds the whole idea of blameworthiness as to be laughable bullshit. And that's the view I sympathize with. We should read that quote, by the way. It's such a yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, let's read it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Galen, right? Quoting Nietzsche. Yeah, it's in Galen. So he's talking about moral responsibility and the cause of sui that's required for it, being self-caused. It's the best self-contradiction that has been conceived so far. It is a sort of rape and perversion of logic. But the extravagant pride of man has managed to entangle itself profoundly and frightfully with just this nonsense. The desire for freedom of the will in the superlative metaphysical sense, which still holds sway, unfortunately, in the minds of the half-educated. The desire to bear the entire and ultimate responsibility for one's actions, oneself, and to absolve God, the world, ancestors, chance, and society involves nothing less than to be precisely this cause of sui, and with more than Baron Munchausen's audacity, to pull oneself up into existence by the hair out of the swamps of nothingness. Very nice. <laughs> Gotta love Nietzsche. You could say this whole move that P.F. Strassen makes is to a naturalistic, secular, sociological take on ethics, which is just part and parcel of a lot of modern approaches to ethics, that you start with what people's actual behavior is, and then you ask, can we make a system out of this? Is the practice as we practice it now internally consistent or is it not? And Nietzsche was one of the first right here to say, no, it's actually not. That the something that is at the center of our notion of agency and how we deal with each other without even very much analysis is obviously confused. And not just that, but has all kinds of poisonous consequences for mm -hmm. human psyche and for politics. So. And Nagel's moral luck paper that we read even points out more of this, that there are just things in our intuitions. For instance, we think that you're only responsible for your intention in doing an action. That's one very clear moral intuition. I didn't mean to hurt you, so please don't blame me for hurting you. But we also simultaneously have the intuition that 
the very same action. So if you're just driving recklessly and nothing really happens out of it, or you're driving recklessly and you end up killing somebody, the latter case is much, much worse, is a much worse moral transgression. So just right there, we're looking at two things that you could say we just couldn't give up either of those. Those are essential to our current practice, and yet they're directly contradictory. So the whole edifice yeah. has got to be screwed up in some way. And it's a further question beyond that of how we live, given this discovery that it's messed up. Are we just, yeah, well, yeah. we can keep these things, but do kind of be nicer or more ironic or more loving or something about them. And that ends up being kind of what Watson ends up recommending. Well, no, you, let's remember that Watson is a compatibilist in the end. Although this is his most incompatibilist sounding paper, he is a compatibilist. He does think you can deserve blame, even if determinism is true. And so he's just more sensitive than most to the force of the kind of Galen Strawson type argument. Well, let's go through how he... So he's preying on this, what I thought was actually the strongest (laughs) argument that P.F. Strawson had, you know, what you think of as a weak point. First, he elaborates it, and then he knocks it down. So he wants to take up the idea that determinism is not relevant to our reactive attitudes. He elaborates on that by bringing up this notion of intelligible moral demand. So when we excuse someone or justify someone's behavior, which normally would be considered bad, we appeal not to whether it's determined, but to whether or not the person who's behaving that way is fully a part of the moral community or could fully... Let's see. So the way he puts it is whether or not our moral demand for reasonable regard could be fully intelligible to them or understood by them. So, you know, as we discussed, in most cases, we could appeal to that notion without ever appealing to determinism. If a child does something or someone who's mentally ill and they transgress some moral boundary, we don't have to think about determinism in order to make an excuse. But he brings up this case of Harris. It's cases where we think that some Sam Harris, that bastard. Yes, right. <laughs> Sam Harris, the uh, the neuroscientist and murderer. So Robert Harris, should we tell um, a little yes, bit about that story? Please clarify the example <laughs> yeah. of what I meant. <laughs> yes, let's not get Sam sued Harris, by him. the way, is another guy that I took pot shots at on, on the podcast. He deserves them. Well, he deserves them or... <laughs> But this is not Sam Harris. This is Robert Harris, who committed a really chilling crime. He murdered these two kids. And the most chilling part of it for me was that he wanted to dress up as a cop and then break the news to one of the victim's parents and just sort of watch their faces. I mean, this was a bad guy. And Uh. and then so so Watson tells that story and then says, rightly, I think that this seems like an archetypical candidate for blame and resentment and somebody that you would think deserves punishment. And then afterwards tells the story of how he became what he was. And then after you hear that story, you find yourself a lot more conflicted about how you feel about Harris. Because if if anything, it's more horrific the story of how he was brought up and how he was treated as a child and a young adult than the crime itself. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to throw out my flag here. I'm going to call a procedural penalty. Appealing to the serial killer or the child murderer or something like that when you're having a conversation about morality is the equivalent to me of playing the Nazi card in the sense that We're being asked to appeal to our intuitions and our common sense, you know, some notion of blameworthiness and common morality. In the face of that kind of behavior, we lose any grounding that we could possibly have to make that kind of a judgment. That example does absolutely nothing to clarify, help us understand what it is that we're trying to drive at here. Can I say why it helps? First of all, we're talking about reactive attitudes. So he's yeah. got to he's got to give us an example where we're going to have two conflicting sets of reactive attitudes to someone who's committed a crime. So mm-hmm. on the one hand, we need a description of the crime. That's bad enough to say, yes, he's blameworthy. He should be punished. And just remember that Galen Strassen's really high. The analogy to hell. Right. That's really right. supposed to get at somebody really blameworthy. Right. So, then, But then we need a sort of account of his history and one that would make us feel conflicted, that would make us say, oh, that's exactly how he became that way. He was treated terribly. He was a little boy who just wanted love and he was a sweet little boy. 
and he was fucking brutalized by his parents until he became a monster. So Watson is trying to point out that determinism is, in fact, relevant. We can't do as we did in the case of the child. We can't appeal to this concept of intelligible moral demands, because if we did that, then we might have to completely exonerate someone who seems completely evil like Harris. We actually, in this case, in order to understand why our reactive attitudes are in conflict, we need determinism. We need the concept that he was made into that and that he's not responsible for who he is, his character. That's the worry for Strawson that you captured really well there. But Watson stops short of fully endorsing that view, right? He says, we don't think as a result of his childhood necessarily that it had to happen that he would be who he was. What we're thinking is, well, no wonder he's such a a monster. Right. The inevitability is something that many of us will stop short of, right? It was completely inevitable that he became a killer and actually things are too complicated to say what's inevitable and even if we stop short of that we might still feel a lot more forgiving towards him or at least our reactive attitudes might be suspended just as a result of seeing him also as a victim and not just as a perpetrator of horrible crimes. but an important point here is that it's not a suspension of reactive attitudes it's not we're not slipping into what strawson calls the objective standpoint it's two conflicting sets of reactive attitudes that's really one of watson's crucial points right The fact that Watson, as you said, Tamler, doesn't make that whole change and say, well, these two sets of reactive attitudes are wholly in conflict, that we still end up blaming, even if how much we blame or how much we would forgive is a little warped. You know, it could be that the reason that we still end up with that same verdict that the person is blameworthy is what Seth was just saying, that this is something about which we are not able to think rationally. And that if we take less extreme examples... We say, okay, somebody stole a lot of stuff, and then we give some comparable story of how this person became a kleptomaniac or something. Then we actually would have a wholly, you know, on one hand, we have to take the objective point of view. We have to look at them as a caused being. And then on the other hand, we still want to blame them because they took your stuff. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. very sympathetic to what Seth said, and it's interesting. I, I mean, normally I, I, I'm completely with you on that. I think, and this is a problem for philosophers that we appeal to intuitions, but then we bring up these kinds of cases, either that you know they're thought experiments that we can't imagine what that would be like, like being transported or having our bodies split apart into eight different people or something like that or it's something so horrible to inflame us to a point where we're not thinking clearly at all or at least like we normally do but i think you're right it might apply to harris as well although i take wes's point that he had to choose someone that was already potentially beyond the bounds of the moral community to just make the initial point that he was making but what if you take somebody like bernie madoff What he did, you know, it's not killing two teenagers and it's not cold-bloodedly wanting to watch the parents hear the news that they're... But he he did horrible, horrible things, right? Defrauded so many people out of this. I I owe this example to my colleague, Eddie Namias, who thinks this is a better example than Robert Harris. If you find out stuff about his childhood that led him to become desensitized to defrauding people, how are you going to feel about him then? Namius' point is you're going to still feel resentful towards him. And it's actually the shocking nature of Robert Harris's case actually makes you less likely to respond to him in the normal sort of reactive way, because it just seems so out of the realm of something that we could possibly even consider. It's not an unusual, there's lots of like a book like In Cold Blood, which will have you both by Truman Capote horrified yeah. by the terribleness of the crime and yet empathize with the criminal. That's not a uncommon sort of task that we're asked to take on by culture. Again, I'm struggling from my naive viewpoint here. So I appreciate Mark standing up for me about the <laughs> the fact that you could make the same point with a less extreme example. But help me understand the distinction here between understanding why somebody does what they do. So there's 
saying that somebody had no choice but to do what they do, that's determinism. Because of factors A through Z, so-and-so acted in this way, they had no choice. That's one thing. Then there's, because of factors A through Z, I can understand why somebody did something that otherwise wouldn't make sense, because that's not how normal human beings act. And then, you know, saying, regardless of A through Z, even though I understand why this person might have acted the way they did, that doesn't mean that they're absolved from responsibility or blame. Here's why. The traditional argument is that for us to have moral responsibility, we have to be free in some sense. And that freedom has to be cashed out either in the sense that we could have done otherwise in some situation, otherwise than we did, that the future is full of all these different possibilities and we can settle of our own free will on one of those possibilities, or that we are the ultimate source of our action. The buck stops with us. So if determinism is true, at any given moment, there is only one possible future. You couldn't possibly do anything to change it. So how could you possibly be responsible for that? And the other intuition, I'm not endorsing any of this, by the way, I'm just trying to, for listeners, get at the fundamental argument. And the other intuition is that if if determinism is true, then I am not the ultimate source of my actions. Everything I do was predestined long even before I I was born. So I am just a link in that chain. So those are the intuitions which would make people think if determinism is true, then free will and moral responsibility can't be the case. Okay. I understand conceptually what it is that you're saying. And I understand that we read a couple of articles that would suggest that there's actually somebody with a PhD who believes that or might believe that. But when you're Using these examples to try to illustrate to me, I felt like what you were trying to do is kind of point in that direction to some extent with with these examples. I mean, I don't share that intuition, and it doesn't even make sense to me. So I have a problem right there. Which intuition don't you share? That not being responsible for your character means that you're not responsible for your actions? No, that what Wes just said about there can be no moral accountability if in some way we're 100% determined for our actions. But it's not that we have to discard those as social practices, right? There could be good reasons to, you know, and this is the way Strassen starts out his article, talking about the kind of compatibilist who, in a way, is just a consequentialist. They say, yes, these sorts of practices of moral blame and punishment, they're socially useful. We can't discard them. They're essential to a society. And yet, if we think about it, they're groundless. There is that sort of compatibilism. I don't think that's real compatibilism. Yeah, that's I know. just cuz a skeptic would think that too. You know, a skeptic yeah. would also think that you got to blame your kids if they run into the street to chase a ball because you don't want them to do it again and Yeah. So, if you're going to be an honest to god compatibilist, in my view at least, you have to really believe that it can ground something more than that. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the compatibilism of a uh, of a Hobbes, right, where it's Yeah. It's freedom of action. But again, there are different levels where I think you can cash out a notion of compatibilism where moral blameworthiness and praiseworthiness is incoherent, and yet there is a place for some concept of free will, where you might think, well, most of our actions are unfree in some sense, because they're insensitive to insights into what's good for us, um, reasons for behaving this way or that, reasons for doing what's good for us. So there are compatibilists who cash out a view where if you are sensitive to those sorts of things, then you may have moments when you behave in some sense freely. It's more of a phenomenological kind of account. That's my point, though. The skeptic would also agree that there is that kind of freedom. And the only difference would be that they would say, but that's not really free will. But I think they're wrong about that. I think it's a very, I think it's actually a very robust sense of free will. But I just, I I don't get the the significance of that question. That to me is like saying, is bowling a sport or not? Well, suppose someone said, there's a scientist like Einstein who makes his, you know, special relativity discovery. And you ask him why, and he says, oh, well, I was looking at this sort of contradiction. I had these sorts of insights, and I was sensitive to certain reasons, and I was sensitive to certain data. And they say, no, you weren't. You were just determined by your brain processes. You were determined 
from the beginning of time to make that discovery. You weren't actually sensitive to those things. And of course, he would reply, well, that's stupid. Yes, that's grand determinism. Yes, my insights and my sensitivity to reasons and my and those sorts of things are grounded in brain processes and other deterministic considerations. But that doesn't mean that on one explanatory level, that actually isn't a good account of why I made a certain scientific discovery. Right. But, but I'm saying that the skeptic would agree with that. The skeptic would say, be 100% on board with what you just said. I think the skeptic underestimates the robustness of that sense of free will. That's what I'm saying. So, for instance, a Sam Harris or some of the other neuroscientists writing today, they're not very sophisticated about it. But I don't think they understand the extent to which that kind of compatibilism is... That's an important conception of free will, the idea that human beings can deliberate. When you're making a decision, the idea of freedom is intimately related to being able to reason about things and being constrained by reasons, but also, you know, if you're thinking psychoanalytically by an awareness of emotions, other sorts of things in making decisions. That's why we think, you know, when we're deliberating, like take a paradigmatic case where someone is tempted to do something that's bad for them. And they have a conflict, you know, I want to eat this ice cream, but it's bad for me. So let's make a decision. This is just the kind of common sense notion of free will. And you do some deliberating and you say, the ice cream's bad for me, so I'm not going to eat it, even though I wanted to. Okay, that stands on analogy to the whole scientific discovery thing I was talking about. Granting determinism, let's say, just because all of that is underwritten by brain processes and determinism doesn't affect the important phenomenology of the fact that you were sensitive to reasons and able to deliberate and make a choice. And again, yes, a skeptic could come along and say that, well, that's not real freedom. But of course, no other conception of freedom is actually coherent. If you say that freedom has nothing to do with reasons, that it's just random sort of dispensations from some sort of substance that has no rhyme or reason to it at all. I think we're agreeing here, right? Yeah. I, I'm not disputing that that's a real sense of freedom. Right. And that a skeptic who denied that, I just don't think it's a, I think this is an issue of terminology. I don't think when it's disconnected from whether that kind of freedom can ground blameworthiness or desert of punishment, it just becomes, well, do you want to call that free will or do you not want to call that free will? The reason why is because I think it still has moral implications, as I pointed out before. So It doesn't have moral implications whether you call it free will or not. What has moral implications is how much of that freedom we actually have, which is an empirical question. I don't see what the moral implications are of calling whatever freedom we have free will or not calling it free will. Well, it's not just about calling it free will or not calling it free will. It's about, you can call it skepticism. You can say it's compatible with skepticism if you want. But I think skeptics lose sight of that sort of fact, that sort of reason responsive compatibilist theory and why it's important. So Galen Strawson doesn't deny that we can deliberate. So there's two separate questions, right? There's the question of what percentage of our actions and decisions are the result of deliberative processes where we're responding and we're sensitive to reasons, right? That's an empirical question. And then there's a question of, well, whatever the answer to that question is, is that enough to call that, you know, that we have free will? You know, is that enough to say that when an action is the result of these deliberative processes? What other conception of free will are you talking about? What other conception of free will is actually coherent? Well, I don't think there is. I, I'm in yeah. agreement with you and Galen that there is right. no other. I, I'm not a libertarian, right? So we agree on that. The only reason I'm objecting to the label of skepticism for that, because I think there are skeptics who draw more pessimistic conclusions than are really necessitated by that point of view. I mean, I think you're right when it comes to some of the neuroscientists. I don't think philosopher skeptics do that. I think we understand each other on that. So the terminological thing that we, we are arguing a, a little about here is comparable to the one between what you might call moral naturalism and moral error theory. That if you say that mm -hmm. in a strong sense that there is no metaphysical fact of something's being good or bad, that then we can do or not do those actions. And whether or not those actions are just or not is whether they accord with this external fact. If we start, as most moderns do, with 
actual human behavior and, and try to make something coherent out of that. There are plenty of people that's going to say, well, you've just in that move given up morality altogether. Right. That what morality essentially is, is something like divine command theory. And I'm thinking of Anscombe that we read recently that says, once you get rid of that underlying structure, what you're doing is not ethics at all. Sure. Right. But that, of course, there are plenty of naturalists that claim that they are doing ethics, even though they've gotten rid of that superstructure. And I think that's what we're, we're facing Absolutely. here is that determinism says that there's a strong sense of moral responsibility that is bullshit, just like Nietzsche pointed right. out. But once you get rid of that, you still can have very useful gradations. And you can say that the distinction between those is not just a terminological matter that we're just going, oh, these are going to be, we're going to call these the free actions, the ones that nobody was holding a gun to your head and you you didn't have a phobia or something that was driving you in some obvious way to do this. We're going to call those the free actions and we're going to call the compelled ones the unfree actions. You can still say there are moral implications to that, as Wes is trying to say, without buying into the larger traditional framework. And it's all part of this critique and refinement of exactly what P.F. Strassen says we cannot critique, which is this practice of resentment. No, 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 because you are critiquing it within the framework. You're doing what P.F. Strassen says is okay. Isn't it critiquing it within the framework is talking about a particular case? It's not talking about, in general, all cases of free actions really aren't moral responsible in some important way. They do not meet the criteria that Galen Strassen asked for, that if there was a hell, this person would deserve to go to hell if they did something bad enough. Or it just would, they would deserve. I mean, I, I don't mind the heaven-hell analogy if you think of it as hell is just a little worse than heaven, right? It's like the <laughs> restaurants are a little worse, you know, or, um, <laughs> you know, they're, like they don't have good movie theaters. But like, you know, I think that's really that a lot of people have tried to get off the hook of the basic argument by pointing out that well, I'm a compatibilist and I don't think anybody could deserve to go to hell and suffer eternal torment. But here's the thing. Here's where I think the I don't know, what is it? The rubber meets the road or whatever the cliche is, right? Where Galen Strawson says, if one takes the notion of justice that is central to our intellectual and cultural tradition seriously, then the evident consequence of the basic argument is that there is a fundamental sense in which no punishment or reward is ever ultimately just. It is exactly as just to punish or reward people for their actions as it is to punish or reward them for the natural color of their hair or the natural shape of their faces. So whether you agree with that last part, right? Is It is exactly as just to punish or reward people for their actions as it is to punish or reward them for the natural color of their hair or natural shape of their faces. To me, that's what puts you on the side of the skeptic, like Galen, who agrees with it, or the compatibilist, who I think has to disagree with it if there's going to be a substantive difference between their position and the skeptical position. You have to think it's actually more just to punish somebody for their actions, as long as it meets the compatibilist yeah. criteria, sensitivity to reason, or whatever it is. I disagree with this. Yeah. Isn't the issue of this term ultimately just, that is something that we don't really understand. He doesn't say ultimately just, he says it's just exactly as just. To punish or reward. Earlier, he says there's a fundamental sense in which no punishment or reward is ever ultimately just. But I think the ultimately is a distraction there. It's the just part, right? Is it fair? It's exactly as fair to punish or reward people for their actions as it is to punish or reward them for the natural color of their hair. Now, Galen, he endorses that claim, right? The earlier version of me completely endorsed that claim. And so I called myself a skeptic. Explain your transition from skepticism to compatibilism. What motivated that? Honestly, I have my daughter. My position has been described as skepticism until I have a daughter, then compatibilism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had my daughter and I just thought about, you know, if somebody hurt her, would I consider that person blameworthiness? Assuming that they deliberated about it, they weren't just a complete lunatic or they didn't do it by accident, etc. Right. And then thinking my official position right now is, well, that person's not self-cause. They're not cause of sui, and so they don't deserve blame. They don't deserve punishment. But that just seemed to me to be obscene. Like, So I know I wouldn't react that way. But this is more than a psychological claim. This is like, I thought that that would be an inappropriate reaction to have if somebody harmed my daughter. And I continue to think this. Now, this is the kind of thing that makes me want to buy a shotgun. 
I continue to think that this is way too abstract and theoretical when you're actually talking about a real human relationship and real life. And I just, I wasn't comfortable with being so disconnected. My philosophy, I've always thought, has to have some real world implications. Amen. If I'm going to spend some time on it. And if my official view and my actual view, including my endorsement, my like normative endorsement of that view are two different things, I didn't feel like I could comfortably call myself a pure skeptic anymore. My problem with P.F. Strassen in general is this thinking that the notion of resentment is fundamental, when in fact, what is fundamental is anger. Resentment is this analytical hoity-toity thing that we have anger plus some philosophical baggage packed into it, that I only will resent you if there are certain causal concomitants behind your action. The case with your daughter is exactly like the Nazi example that Seth was complaining about, in that this is something that you can't think rationally about. And I would say it's not a matter that you would resent, in Strassen's sense, somebody that harmed your daughter. It would not matter if this person, you know, if it's a seven-year-old that came and shot your daughter. It would matter, though. That would See, that would matter. That's wrong, right? You would think differently about a seven-year-old that shot your daughter or a lunatic that shot one of your children versus somebody who did it and mm. thought about it and deliberated I don't think most parents, it. though, I, from my experience. Right. This is the, the, the rage. Newspaper articles about most people's natural reactions are not. It doesn't matter the age. Again, so forget shooting, just hurting. Don't make it that dramatic. Don't make it like something that you're killing or something like that. There's a kind of case where you would feel anger and just a kind of boiling over. And then there's a the kind of thing where you would actually really want to get revenge in a more specific way on that person because they meet certain compatibilists condition right so all of these feelings are understandable and i don't think any i think anyone who said some philosophical theory should make it so that you're not angry yeah it, but just because we can accept having certain feelings about things and reactive attitudes doesn't mean that they are a moral compass that's my problem with that and i think you know you see this in a lot in politics today and this is one of the things that nietzsche railed against is that people assume that their moral outrage is some sort of compass to what's right and wrong, when often it's bullshit. It's completely deceptive as to the rightness and wrongness of the matter, and it leads people into all sorts of errors. So this type of thing really does have consequences. If we say that our reactive attitudes are just the gold standard that determine our morality, I think it's a problem. Right, like as if the victims of every crime should be the ultimate jurors or something. My ultimate juror was me reflecting whether that was an appropriate attitude to have. That was my ultimate juror, not just that I had the attitude. It can be an appropriate attitude without saying anything about larger moral concerns, because larger moral concerns have to do with how you act on that. You could want to kill. You could completely accept the idea that you wanted to kill someone who harmed your daughter as a completely natural attitude and not something you should resist or oppress or be all granola yeah, about. Be pretty messed up oh, if you I'm just going to meditate. Yeah, right. I love exactly. everyone. I don't, you know, and I'm going to use my... They uh, weren't cause of suing. So. Yeah, and, and yeah. that and those <laughs> sorts of reasons. No, you feel those feelings. But the question is what you do about it and what a society does about it. And of course, you don't kill the guy. And I honestly don't think society should kill the guy. So that's the that's the difference, I think. But the guy does deserve a good ass kicking. On one level of description, I agree with you. And I would help you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll hold you to that. All right. I'm going back in my mind to the analogy that Tamler brought up about the criminal justice system at one level versus your everyday interaction morality. And I think there's a conflation when Strassen uses the term just saying it's as just to hold somebody responsible for X that they're born with versus, you know. The term justice is a loaded term, and I don't think it equates simply to an idea of blameworthiness or some level of everyday morality. So what's your idea of blameworthiness then? Well, I think my idea of blameworthiness, I think when you hold somebody to blame for something, there's a sense in which you believe that they did something with intent, and they could have done otherwise than what they did. There was some matter of choice in the everyday sense of it, and that it was done with either, I should say, intent or through neglect. 
at least to some extent. So by virtue of being neglectful, you could be blameworthy for having something be done. That being said, I can certainly imagine circumstances where you think, okay, well, that person's not to blame, but you do hold them responsible and accountable in some way that's more in line with social norms and justice versus a kind of everyday moral sense. Like I can say, oh, you know what? You're right. That statute about having your yards fenced in in a certain way to prevent people from wandering through and falling into your well, right? I don't hold you to blame because you weren't aware of that statute and it's rare for somebody to come stumbling through, but I might still think that the statute that enforces that is makes sense and that I could think that you're responsible or you're accountable in some way with respect to reparations or what have you. So like strict liability laws. Something like that, yeah. And that's the same sense to me in which you say, when we have this common liberal leftist view where we say like, well, so-and-so had a, they came from rough circumstances and they didn't know any better and they weren't nourished in the womb. Parents didn't teach them good values and they didn't see all these different ways that they didn't have an opportunity to go to college. So they turned to drug dealing, blah, blah, blah. So you find an excuse or reasoning like that as a way to try to absolve somebody of blame and at the same time say, but... The way in which our society works, we have to hold you accountable for those actions because we can't have you running around doing that sort of thing. What you're saying is that we have different purposes for which we might hold someone responsible. So the way when you say blameworthiness, well, what kind of blame? What does the action of blame consist in? It's not just me having an attitude and being annoyed with them because I'm annoyed with people for lots of things that if I then think harder about it, then, well, okay, it's not really their fault. You know, it's just, it's this assumption that resentment or that the reactive attitudes are non-cognitive, that they're raw emotions, but then also thinking that somehow they're a system and you can't question the system. They're not a system. Maybe it's, it can provide some foundation for a system, but then it requires cultural work, philosophical work to actually make this into something coherent and figure out what blameworthiness actually means. Well, but do you think Strawson thinks that the reactive attitudes form a system? Well, if you're going to use the analogy as you did of the Euclidean system versus relativity, certainly that is clearly a system in the way that this is not. I'm less clear about whether induction constitutes a system, a set of principles But I would think that if you say that there's something about our reactive attitudes that we cannot question, if you're going to be at all specific about, well, what is it that we can't question? Then you have to say that our reactive attitudes have some underlying claims in them and not just that it's okay that we blame each other. That it has to be something more specific than that. As specific as he gets, which isn't very specific. I mean, this is part of the problem, but also maybe the beauty of the essay is that he doesn't try to get too meticulous about anything. But I think what he's saying is the one thing that can't happen is you saying nobody should ever be or is ever the appropriate target of resentment. That's the thing that can't happen. And that it's always inappropriate for you to have reactive attitudes towards somebody's actions. As long as you agree that sometimes resentment is appropriate, sometimes gratitude is appropriate, sometimes forgiveness is appropriate, and so on and so on, then his point, I think, holds and he can have his compatibilism as he understands it. It's just that the whole system can't come crashing down. The web But again, I think Watson is right that determinism is relevant. It does affect our reactive attitudes, right? And once you do that, I think you're in trouble. So here's my question, though. It's definitely when you first read about determinism, it has a strong effect. But is it then when you're getting back into your everyday life? I'm of two minds on this because part of me thinks there are times where if somebody is doing something to me that I have no control over, like when I was in grad school, if a professor wasn't getting their job letters in on time, it was honestly helpful for me to just think of them and their actions being determined, or at least not self-determined, as a way of just calming me down and not being so pissed off, right? And so, in that sense, I agree with you and disagree with Strassen. On the other hand, I also see that there's a type or category of behavior where that's the last thing that crosses your mind, whether the person's actions were determined. You're focused on far more specific things than whether the person was determined or not. And if somebody tells you, yeah, but ultimately Mm -hmm. that person's actions were determined by factors that trace back all the way to the Big Bang, you'll say, I don't give a fuck about that. That's not the point. 
There's a lot of room for irony. We can have reactive attitudes that some reflective level we don't fully endorse. We can be of two minds. And this could be even as something as trivial as being at a football game and saying, I'm a fan of this team, which we know is arbitrary bullshit, but we can still behave and fully have all kinds of emotions and strong emotions about all that stuff. I don't think there's anything <laughs> arbitrary <laughs> bullshit about being a fan of a team. What are you? I mean, you, grew, you live. You're in Boston. Jesus Christ! I grew up in Boston. That's all that matters to me, really. Is Boston? Yes. Sports. Well, you either become a uh, huge Boston sports fan, or you develop some sense of irony about it. <laughs> yeah. It seems like what you're pointing at is that once you make the move to moral naturalism or error theory, depending on the point of view, then evaluations require a context. So if you ask is it appropriate for me to be resentful? There really is a difference between ultimately appropriate, and you might think that all of our gut reaction of attitudes, our aesthetic judgments, our moral judgments, they all make this internal claim toward absolutism. That if I say this ice cream is delicious, the actual content of my statement is not, well, I am an organism that is interacting with this stimulus and coming up with the judgment delicious. We're making a claim about the thing itself. You could say, well, there's a philosophical mistake there. We shouldn't say it's ultimately delicious, but that doesn't mean that we can't make those kind of claims anymore. It's just there's a context in which we make those claims and we can get familiar with the nuances of the context so that I can say, well, why don't you just try it a few more times? Try this other thing first. Maybe you can get used to it. There's ways that we can modify ourselves in this way. In the same way, if you ask, is it okay for me to feel resentful about this? intuitively, we are asking outside of any context. We're assuming that there are moral absolutes, that there is a moral metaphysical structure underlying things. But again, and I'm channeling Anscombe here, once you mature up and you get rid of anything resembling divine command theory, then you think, no, 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 all these judgments are made within some context of social practice. The thing that I can't decide about P.F. Strassen is whether he's acknowledging that Anscombe point and saying, look, yeah, this is a social practice that we find ourselves irreparably psychologically a part of. And so it's completely irrelevant, the metaphysical issue, because we're just talking internal to this practice or whether he is saying, as Galen Strassen seems to be saying, you can't actually believe in free will. You can't believe in moral responsibility without believing in the ultimacy, right? Without having taken the step past the naive view. I think of the former, definitely. I mean, okay. I think you actually captured it really nicely in the former. There are a couple of things you say. First of all, the metaethics analogy, error theory versus moral naturalism, I think maps on perfectly to this debate. So I think you're right about that. But the thing I wanted to pick up on is when you said there's a sense in which you can say, well, that's not ultimately delicious. But really what you're talking about when you say that something is delicious is there's a context in which that makes sense. I think P.F. Strassen's point is that you would be preposterously over-intellectualizing the facts if you thought (sighs) that when people said this is delicious, they meant in some ultimate sense of deliciousness that's incoherent. That's obviously not what people mean when they say that something is delicious. Galen Strassen, when I interviewed him, he made this kind of analogy, but on the other side with disgusting. He said, you look at a rotting corpse and you say that's disgusting, but it's not obviously objectively disgusting in some sense. And again, what P.F. Strassen would say to his son there is you are over intellectualizing the facts about disgusting. That's not what people mean when they say that something is disgusting, that it has some objective property of disgustingness. They mean that they are disgusted by that thing and probably that other people would also be disgusted by them. They don't mean anything more than that. And this idea that ultimacy is some sort of criterion for something being true or something being appropriate to say or feel is some weird philosopher's thing. It has nothing to do with what people are actually doing, what people are actually feeling. So saying resentment is never appropriate in an ultimate sense is like saying nothing is really delicious. That's ridiculous. But I think the real conflict, though, here is between feelings and action. We can say that it's fine to have certain feelings as long as we say, but you're not warranted in acting on those feelings. And this is where I think this goes astray. I don't think the reactive sentiments themselves are simply constitutive because I think people have a lot of morally questionable reactive attitudes and that moral questionableness only emerges at some level of reflection. 
And as Watson points out, determinism is relevant to our reactive attitudes. And if it is, then moral culpability must transcend our reactive attitudes. Right, reactive attitudes can't be constitutive of moral responsibility if determinism affects them. And if that's not true, if you don't have some sort of descriptive statement about how the world is that you can put in as a barrier, that's another level in between what morality is and what our reactive attitudes are, then we're bound to become skeptics because there are strong reasons to be skeptical about reactive attitudes because we often form our reactive attitudes without knowing much about the person we're forming them about. But if we knew their history, at least the Harris case is supposed to illustrate this, that would change our reactive attitudes. So on reflection, I think we would be inclined to be somewhat skeptical about our reactive attitudes. And if so, if those are simply constituted of moral responsibility, then that would have to lead us to become skeptics about moral responsibility. And I'm just reciting Watson's argument here. But only if it made you think that in every case, when you learn about their history, you find that the reactive attitudes are inappropriate. That's the only way that you, according to P.F. Strawson, would have to be a skeptic. If upon learning about Harris's history, your reactive attitudes were altered, I think that's fine for Strawson, as long as Harris is a special case and not just representative of everybody you would learn the history about. But I think our, our lot, you know, I think Mark pointed this out, our lives are full of cases in which we're irritated by people and angry at people. And if we knew the circumstances, we would be far more charitable. If all the people we were driving in traffic with were recognizable to us as people knew we knew as friends, we'd cut them much more slack instead of launching into morally indignant rage, right? It's the fact that they're unknowns to us, which motivates a great deal of our reactive attitudes. We can project all kinds of maliciousness and other sorts of things into them. So let's change your thought experiment, Tamler, to imagine not just that you have a daughter, but you have a daughter and a son, and the son is the one that hurts the daughter. Do you have the same full-blown resentment toward the son, or do you, what do you do with that? Again, it's not going to be the same exact kind of resentment, but it'll be resentment, right? I mean, I actually think the reactive attitudes are strongest when we're talking about people that you know and the people that you care about, and if they wrong you in some way, you're going to feel extra resentful. I mean, if your best friend fucks you over, that's when I think your resentment is going to be at its highest level and most immune to any considerations of determinism. And I think this is the other part of Strassen's point that we haven't talked about. If you start finding yourself moved by, you know, oh, well, yeah, my best friend fucked me over, stabbed me in the back, slept with my girlfriend or whatever, but it was determined. Once you start thinking that way, he's not your best friend anymore. You're thinking about him in different terms at that point when you take the objective attitude towards them. But when you're in that mode of it's your friend and you expect them to treat you in a certain way, and if they violate that, you're really pissed off. It's a big part of what it means to have a good friend and to be invested in the friendship. So, yeah, it would be different if it was my son, but my reactive attitudes would still be very strong. And I expect my son, if I had one, not to hurt my daughter even more than I expect a stranger not to hurt my daughter. You bring up actually a good point about resentment that Watson brings up that he pulls out of Strawson is that resentment is not just irritation. It's a form of communication, it looks like. It's that you are trying to censure the person. You're trying to say, this is not okay. And that would be especially keen if somebody that you know or have trusted is the one who's the offender. You thought you had some commonality and it's not an internal reaction to you. It's you reaching out to this person and saying, how could you possibly do this? What that assumes if you think you're communicating is some sort of shared values. Right. Right. I thought I taught you better than that, my son. I thought we had all these things in common. And now I'm bewildered and trying to get you to explain how you could possibly act, given that I know that this was instilled in you or with your friend. And then Watson kind of tries to smack that down or at least temper it by saying how actually then that doesn't help with the Robert Harris case, because here is someone who obviously we have tons of resentment toward, but who would not be an appropriate object of moral communication because he doesn't have any common values with us. He's too far beyond that. He almost has to be dealt with in the objective mode. He's shut himself he's so off. Outside. Right? He's shut himself yes, off from any yes. kind of moral address. 
Watson is saying he hasn't shut himself off to moral address. A child who does something to shut him off to moral address. If he were shut off to moral address, then we'd be excusing every evil person there was. I think, Wes, that he does say that Harris has explicitly sort of cut himself off from... Yes, he's not part of the moral community, but Watson's point is that it's not intelligible moral demand that's at issue in this example. Right. It's determinism through his background and history. At this point, as before you know about its history, his point there is just that resentment can't be a form only of moral communication because he has set himself beyond moral communication or moral address. Though it's right. later that the determinism comes into the story. Right? Isn't that right, Mark? I'm partially still looking at this as a reductio ad absurdum against our pre-philosophical beliefs that there are just things that are inconsistent, that we really do see resentment insofar as it's not just anger, but it has some judgment to it. We do see it as a form of reaching out to someone in the moral community. And so Watson bringing in this Robert Harris example of someone that, on the one hand, we do completely want to blame, but on the other hand, is not amenable to that kind of communication, just means that there's something wrong in our pre-philosophical moral views. Okay, so here's the paragraph, right? He says, however, not all communication is dialogue. Harris refuses dialogue, and this refusal is meant to make a point. It is, in effect, a repudiation of the moral community. He thereby declares himself a moral outlaw. Unlike the small child, or in a different way, the psychopath, he exhibits an inversion of moral concern, not a lack of understanding. Right. His ears are not deaf, but his heart is frozen. This characteristic, which makes him utterly unsuitable as a moral interlocutor, intensifies rather than inhibits the reactive attitudes. Right. Uh, Harris's form of evil consists, in part, in being beyond the boundaries of the moral community. Hence, if we are to appeal to the constraints on moral address to explain certain type 2 pleas, we must not include among these constraints co-membership in the moral community right. or the significant possibility of dialogue. But then in the postscript, which I don't have in this version... Do you guys not have that shit? No. Because he does say that because he apologized at the end, right before his execution and his final statement, it shows that he was not entirely beyond the bounds of mm. the moral community or something like that. Not convincing. <laughs> convincing of what? An apology. Last minute contrition. Well, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Yeah. But the whole, you know, just the larger picture again, the whole point of that example is that this idea of intelligible moral demand was meant to be a way to wriggle out of determinism's relevance, right? It's not determinism that's relevant, it's intelligible moral demand. And in this case, we're showing that, no, intelligible moral demand isn't the deciding factor. First of all, because we don't think of him in the same way as the child, even though similarly, he's not part of the moral community, but also because determinism does affect our reactive attitudes and not by putting us into the objective position, but by right. creating two sets of conflicting reactive attitudes. I guess I just want to say that I've been taking the P.F. Strassen side in this and arguing against Wes, but it's ironic because I feel the force of the basic argument. I also think that the implications of the basic argument are not as dire as some people think. In fact, a lot of my earlier work was meant to show that you could take the objective attitude and still love people and still have strong friendships and interpersonal relationships. So I think that there are two sides to this issue, and it's almost like a Necker cube. You can see it both ways. I can see it the Elder Strassen way. I can see it the Younger Strassen way. And lately, I'm just more and more skeptical that there is a right way to see the issue of moral responsibility, that we just have these conflicting intuitions, conflicting practices, our attitudes and our beliefs and all this stuff are one big jumbled mess and that we don't have to systematize it. We don't have to come up with a theory of responsibility that has necessary and sufficient conditions, that these things are complex in a good way. And I guess just thinking that makes me side more with Peter Strassen than with Galen Strassen, who I think is a lot more systematic about how he approaches this topic. Well, that leads well into my talking about how confused and maybe there is no right answer that our pre-philosophical attitudes are a vague mess 
And I think you run into some philosophers that argue that actually our pre-philosophical attitudes are quite conservative. So we just read some Barclay and it's only philosophers who come along after the fact and say that when I say the book is in front of me, that I'm talking about a material object that would exist even if no human beings – well, a book is not a good example, but the stone is in front of me, that the stone would exist even if no human beings had ever existed, if there's no perceivers. And so you have some people like Barclay that say that our pre-philosophical attitudes are quite modest and that we really just have to get back to those – that seems to be kind of what I'm seeing in P.F. Strassen here is, like you were saying, Tamler, that there's no ultimacy built into our notion of blameworthiness. There's no, this person deserves to go to hell. The difference between just and ultimately just, the ultimate part is some philosophical thing that's added after the point. So P.F. Strassen is like one of these people who's just trying to get us back to our natural attitude before philosophy screwed us up. Whereas... Galen Strauss, and I see as more taking, I think, a view that I more agree with is to say that our pre-philosophical attitudes are actually quite overweening. They're not specific, but just to repeat the example, I do think that, you know, natively, and it's always a question of what you mean by natively. Do you mean as spoken by an adult in today's society? But if you're talking about the aesthetic thing, is this ice cream is delicious? I, when I say natively, I'm more thinking about when a four-year-old says that before they realize that like not everybody likes ice cream. And just because they don't like ice cream doesn't mean that they're blind, <laughs> tasteless assholes or something. Really, our native pre-philosophical intuitions about moral issues, about aesthetic issues, about epistemological issues are quite expansive. And it is the role of philosophy to pull them back, to add skepticism, to say there's something screwed up about this, that if we actually try to build a systematic foundation on these sentiments, then we come up with a load of crap. We have to do a lot of actual philosophical work to make it coherent. And the fact that we have so many different schools is because people sort of go in different directions. We just covered Bergson in the last episode. This is to say that, you know, maybe we need to get back to the uh, intuition of the matter. And I think Bergson was properly non-committal about whether the natural pre-philosophical attitudes are timid or are overweening. <laughs> and what Strassen would say to you is that the metaphysics are in the eye of the metaphysician. That's the big disagreement. I think you summed it up very nicely. If you think that people's beliefs are expansive when they say things like this ice cream is delicious or that person is morally irresponsible or blameworthy, if you think that people are actually attaching a metaphysical property to them or something like that, Strawson would say the metaphysics are in the eye of the metaphysician. It's not really how it is. So I'm listening to Mark talk, and I'm always concerned that the words pre-philosophical is like code that means something like irrational or... It means pesky. <laughs> it means pesky, and there you go. <laughs> You're the noble savage that we bring on the episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. There were times during the course of the conversation tonight where I sort of checked out with the ists and the isms. And, you know, I kept wanting to get at what is the live issue for me as a moral agent in my everyday life that's being debated here. I think there's probably something in the kind of blameworthiness understood at kind of an interpersonal level versus a criminal level that I might be able to run with. I was intrigued by... Tamler's use of the induction analogy. And then further, we kind of expanded on that and talking about a real difference between everyday morality and kind of the criminal justice system and how you might have to employ different things. But that's where I kind of start to struggle in that, to me, morality is something that takes place at the level of the social. And kicking off this discussion, talking about determinism and the relationship between moral accountability and this sense of being determined is almost like trying to make morality into an ontological thing or trying to mm -hmm. determine it ontologically when I feel like it's something that gets determined at the level of the social. And I won't say it's pre-philosophical. You can call me anti-philosophical if you want. But saying that something happens at the level of the social or socially constructed doesn't mean to me that it's not rational or structured. It just means that in a conceptual way, it may not lend itself to the types of distinctions that philosophers like to make. And so that's one whole issue I have. And then the other whole issue I have is I need to understand what's at stake in a philosophical debate, like what's really at issue and what's worth getting upset about. And clearly there's something here that Wes and Tamler find really energizing, but 
I don't know what's at stake in it for me yet. <laughs> well, like deserving punishment is at stake. But is there any live, real conversation that people are going to say, well, there's really no sense in which anybody deserving punishment makes any sense? Yeah, like Galen Strawson, like every skeptic about moral responsibility, they'll say, yeah, and, and you know, Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne and all the new yeah. come to the party late neuroscience <laughs> skeptics. They're going to say that too. And they're going to say that if you punish somebody, it has to be for utilitarian reasons. It yeah. can't be because they deserve it. That's a significant difference. Yeah, it's a very popular view among these popular neuroscientists these days. And Nietzsche. <laughs> wow. Maybe we should have said that earlier. But also, you know, there's an alternative way of looking at ethics where the question of blameworthiness is just not really relevant, I think. So, again, I think it would lead us back to virtue ethics and concepts of eudaimonia and flourishing, psychological health. And I think there are certain robust compatibilist conceptions of freedom that are important to those ways of thinking about morality. But the traditional or, the, let's say, the naive conception of moral responsibility with its metaphysical foundation, let's say, the one that Nietzsche was railing against. It's not even coherent to me, nor is that sort of idea of freedom. I don't think you can even make sense of it once you start to examine it. The Sam Harris's annoy me because they simply ignore compatibilism. You know, and I know, Tamler, you think that my position collapses into skepticism, but I think there is a nuanced view of compatibilism, which is thinking about a robust conception of free will, but for which this question of blameworthiness is just not relevant. It seeds the ground to determinism on that. And which is not to say that we have to change our reactive attitudes and our feelings. You know, this is my shtick. This is the thing I've sort of milked in my writing on the blog, the opposition to moral outrage and the daily cultural manifestations of that, because people identify their moral outrage with what is moral. And in a way, I think that's one of the things that... Um, that makes this country great. That Nietzsche <laughs> set himself up in opposition to. People are not good at morality by nature. And that's why history is filled with atrocities. Those atrocities are predicated. This is, the, again, it's the Plato, no human being knowingly does evil sort of thing. Often people are in a state of self-righteous indignation. They completely are convinced that what they're doing is good when they're doing the worst possible things. They're killing en masse the evil ones. Right. It's those unhuman evil ones that need to be killed and destroyed. Morality, in that sense, is a force for great evil in the world. And so that's why, you know, you see someone like me reacting, saying, no, we do need this important reflective barrier between our reactive attitudes and what we consider to be just or moral. And also... You can stake a position in morality where retribution and resentment and those sorts of things are just not relevant. Absolutely. Yeah. I kind of want to add that the distinction that P.F. Strassen makes between this criticism internal to a system and criticism of the system itself, I think, is perhaps untenable. That you could respond to what Wes just said by saying, well, that's just, you know, if we blame all the Jews for our problems and feel like we have to have a Holocaust against them, that's just a, a mistaken attribution. It's not against resentment per se. It's against this particular application of resentment. But if you think, as Nietzsche does, that we are so consistently yeah. screwed up, then you're, right. you're starting to question resentment itself. Right. One can be a pessimist about reactive attitudes themselves. But yeah. So I, what <laughs> Seth said at first, before he said that there's nothing at stake in this whole debate, for me, was about it growing out of a just social interactions. And you sounded to me exactly like capturing P.F. Strassen's point in freedom and resentment. Are you disagreeing with Wes and what he just said? Is that Are those two things opposed or are they consistent or tangential to each other? Hmm. It says, says, but it was Wes's closing. I wasn't listening to that. We're about to stop recording. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened just there. <laughs> no, I think Wes and I are not in agreement on this one. Yeah. Well, then you should resent each other. Well, no, because I take the objective... <laughs> stance <laughs> and he's beyond the bounds how, of the moral you community. ask yourselves how do i manage wes how do i what's my policy for dealing with wes wes made a good point earlier when you were talking about how we treat people who are close to us different that one of the reasons we can be indignant on the road is that 
if we knew everybody in the cars were our friends, we'd, we'd react differently than when they're strangers. Well, a lesson that I've been trying to learn lately is I just imagine that there's no agency at all. I don't even think about the people in the car. It's just like I'm in a stream floating down the stream and there are leaves in the stream. And <laughs> when I divorce myself from the idea that there's an agent in the car that has some sort of intent that somehow crosses my intent and I just think, well, yeah, exactly. then it's amazingly so much easier to stay calm and to not get upset. And I yeah. find that a very healthy way of right. thinking of things. But would you find that healthy if you were doing that with your wife? No, I'm talking about driving in a car right. on the freeway. Right, but, right, so a context of resentment again. Yeah. We're talking about a context. And it is because those Social. sorts of things where I get cut off and I'm angered, this is what a psychoanalyst would call narcissistic injury. It's not the pain of being cut off and being deprived of a few seconds, you know, on your way to work. That's not the painful thing about that. The painful thing, you know, of course, Strawson points this out, is the lack of respect. It's a lack of goodwill on the part of the other person. But often... We're just making that up. They're doing something they don't know what they're doing, or they're lost, or they're distracted, or this or that. Yeah. So it's best just to think of everyone as robots, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never have any problems with anyone again. <laughs> Recommending psychopathy. Yes. The super objective standpoint. Although I have a Roomba in my house that I have strong reactive attitudes against. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that fucking Roomba. I want that Roomba dead and taken apart and i don't know if it can suffer but if it can i want it to suffer well that's that's actually an interesting point because people do of course have reactive attitudes towards inanimate objects so herodotus tells a famous story of i think it's xerxes trying to cross the hellespont and it's stormy and so he can't cross with his ships so he has the sea whipped and then he drops shackles into the ocean and does all sorts of nasty things to it as a punishment for being too stormy to cross. And did it work? Yeah, I think they, they ended up conquering ancient Greece, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had to get across the Hellespawn to get at the Greeks. So, yeah. Thanks again for doing this, Tamler. Thank you very much for having me. I really I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Did you really? I did. I do. I, I have gratitude. Okay, I have yeah. experiencing gratitude. Towards all yeah, of thanks for coming on. I, I enjoyed that as well. All right, next time we'll be discussing sections of Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia from 1974. To find out exactly what to read, check out PartiallyExaminedLife.com. We are supported by your donations. Go to PartiallyExaminedLife.com to make a contribution. Big donors over the last month have included Aaron Schur, Miguel Alvarez, Aaron Amini, Kenneth Joyner, Mikhail Mikertichan, Sean Dansberger, Kelby King Cannon, Bryce Nickel, Justin Bossert, Peter Gibney, and Aaron Kimchi. Thanks also to the smaller donors, including the many who are newly or on a continued basis signed up for our $5 a month citizen site. Folks should go follow us on Twitter. They should go join our Facebook group. They should go read the blog at PartiallyExaminedLife.com and should listen to the Very Bad Wizard podcast. All right. Good night. Good night. Thanks good again night. for having me. Good night. <laughs>